All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Vicki Hagberg. I'm a small business consultant with Northland SBDC. And I'm here today with Ravina Claxton. We are going to be talking about um, strategies for employee retention today. And I just wanted to remind everyone again, feel free to use the chat and Q&A features um, to you know, ask any questions that are coming to mind and I'll bring those up to Rovina's attention. And uh, we'll be sending out slides and a copy of this recording, a link to this recording uh, next week when we have that all uploaded. So Ravina, I'll hand it over to you. Well, good morning, everyone. And I'm so happy you've decided to join us today. Uh, for a webinar on strategies for retaining employees, specifically for the small business owner. Um, I'm Ravina Claxton. I am the principal consultant with North Shore HR Consulting. I office here just outside of Grand Marais, Minnesota in Cook County. I've been in the HR business for many years, over 30 at this point in time in all facets of HR, whether it's uh, compensation and benefits, employee labor relations, occupational health and safety. As well, my husband and I own a small business, um, which we've owned in the Twin Cities and currently operate remotely um, for the last 13 years. So <clears throat> very familiar with the challenges that small businesses are experiencing certainly in this arena of talent management practices. So this is actually one of three workshops that are being sponsored by the Northland Small Business Development Center. We had one last month that was on uh, select the best on hiring strategies in a tight labor market. Um, we have the one today on once you secure the talent um, how do you keep them on your team? And then finally, in late June, which I'll talk about in just a minute, we are going to be sponsoring a workshop um, collaborating with Marsh McClellan Benefits Organization um, Agency. And they are going to be working with us to talk about the many benefit options um, that can be affordable for the small business owner. So we'll say a little bit more about that in a little bit. So I think that we should start with our first poll, Vicki, if we could uh, pull that up. All right, so we just launched a poll on, um, you know, what does turnover look like in your business? Um, and so the first question is, you know, are you anticipating turnover in your business during the next six months? Um, whether that's regular amount, more than usual, um, you know, what does that look like? And then Second question is, what is the longest tenure of anyone on your team? So, you know, how long um, has your longest employee been at your business that you can think of? So we'll let people um, keep it open for another couple of seconds here. All right, and I'll close it in just a couple. We have almost everyone in. All right, so I'm gonna share the results here so people in the webinar can hopefully see. Um, and so, you know, we kind of have a mix, it looks like, on what kind of turnover businesses are seeing. So, um, you know, what I'm taking away from this is there's quite a few people in the room who maybe um, don't typically see a lot of turnover in their business, but they wanna make sure they keep it that way. Um, and there's definitely some other folks that are maybe seeing a little bit more turnover than usual and are wanting to address that. And, um, you know, longest tenure of anyone on your team, we have quite a few respondents that have employees that have been there a long time, uh, you know, more than three years at that business. And so that's great news. And I think it's on everyone's mind of how we can keep folks at our, um, our businesses. So it sounds like um, we have 
we must have many good practices already in place for some of the lower turnover. And I'm assuming that this um, is, people are looking for reinforcement as to how to make sure that if I'm struggling, you know, what are some things I can do? But if that hasn't been an issue, how do I make it not be an issue? So we'll be concentrating on those factors today. Um, I want to start out by just sharing a little bit from a SHRM study um, that was published back last month. Here, if I can get my slides to change. Here we go. The Society for Human Resource Management, which is the HR, the National Human Resource Practice Society, reported um, on a study they did back in March. And they called it a turnover tsunami that is expected once the pandemic uh, begins to end. And some of the data that was reported in that survey are extremely interesting. First of all, a quarter of the employees that participated in their survey said that they plan to quit outright once the pandemic begins to subside and the job market improves. Secondly, more than half of the employees that participated in the survey plan to look for a new job in 2021. Some of these may be representing the, the, the passive candidates that are not necessarily out there looking right now, but if something came along, it might be real attractive to them. So in hiring class, we talked about, in our last webinar, we talked about how can we find those passive candidates? But what we wanna talk about here today is how do we avoid people being those passive candidates that hmm, I might just jump uh, to another job if I see something of interest. <clears throat> the third thing that this uh, uh, research reported that it's not just about phys people physically leaving you, they may already be checked out. 46% reported that they feel less connected on the job. 42% of the employees that were surveyed reported the culture in their workplace was just not as good as it had been in the past. And just 21% of those that were surveyed back in March reported being engaged in their work. And I always call engagement being, I can go in and do my very best every day. And so that's a pretty low number to be reporting that they're not that all that engaged on the job. So why is that important to us? It's not only about turnover and uh, keeping people within your business, but it's also about how they represent your business to the customers. We know that highly engaged employees will provide great service. So these are the kinds of things that we wanna focus on today. So our agenda, first of all, um, we are going to start with a little bit about um, um, some Minnesota statistics, but we're also going to talk about this concept that's being used right now in some of the literature and some of the media about how we reboard our employees. You know, there's this onboarding that we all do of our new employees, but how do we reboard them post pandemic? What are some of the things as employers we need to do? What's important to my employees? Do I know that? Uh, because your employees are unique to you. We're gonna talk about creating a positive work culture. And we're gonna center all of this around what are the most common turnover factors um, in the workplace? What are the most common things that cause employees to leave your business? And then finally, we're gonna end with what I call, because I like it, I've used it for many years, and I have just found out that there are many books being written on this. So I'm gonna give a little teaser here. This is gonna be the best retention tool of all. So stand by for that. Of course, because we're going to talk about retention, um, you know, we have to bear in mind that once you get those employees on board, some estimates say that it's double 
the cost of their salary to replace them when they quit from the, if you think about the posting, the selection process, which can be six weeks on average, if you're lucky, and all the training um, that goes into onboarding them. And again, as we go through the final point on the agenda, um, I want to make sure, and I encourage you today, to register for the June 23rd workshop on affordable employee benefits. That's how we're going to start that workshop out. We're going to start with talking about how much does it cost to get into the benefit world for small businesses? How will I know when I can afford to look at things like healthcare benefits? Okay, so we talked a little bit about a national survey. I want to turn our attention to the state of Minnesota because that's where we're uh, mostly operating here. And we know um, firsthand that there are fewer people available in the workforce. There was a very interesting study published a couple of weeks ago by the Minnesota Department of Econo Employment and Economic Development, Minnesota DEED, that talked about the disturbance in the talent pipeline. The um, information and the research talked about it as being not unlike the shortages that we've experienced in our pipeline throughout the pandemic, from toilet paper and lumber to sanitizer. Now we are experiencing a higher demand for talent than we have a supply of talent. And so if you think about it that way, it's also important to note that if you look back at those national statistics, um, in a two month period back in 2020, over 20 million jobs were erased, which were just about as many jobs, 20 million jobs erased than were added in the last decade before that from 2010. So that's a major disruption. And what we are finding in the state of Minnesota, the um, workforce shrank by about 105,000 people, 3% 3 per, 3 who stopped looking at the onset of the pandemic. And this chart shows, if you look at the far right, you can see how it varied and when were the lowest and the, and the highest peaks with the reopening back after the shutdown. But right now we are sitting at about 67%, um, which means that the last time that the available labor workforce of 100%, only 67% of that workforce that is available for work is actually available out there looking employed etc. available for you to come into your business. 67%. That hasn't been as low in the state of Minnesota since 1979. So I only talk about this to say that this is unprecedented and it is something that is just like other shortages. We got to, you know, lock down and understand it's going to be happening for a while and we're probably not gonna come out of it real quickly. One thing to note, um, they did report a number of different reasons why the labor force numbers are down. And this is interesting. Up here in Cook County, we um, suffer when our um, foreign workers or foreign students, especially during tourist season are not available. Um, but there are some additional things, people, Minnesota uh, Department of, or Minnesota Deed is reporting that many people are afraid of contracting COVID. So those safety protocols are going to continue to be vitally important. There's that fear of coming back in the workplace. It's been a year now and it's hard to come back. Um, there's increased difficulty finding childcare. We know that childcare businesses really took a hit. Um, at the beginning and throughout the pandemic. Some people are holding out for their old job or a comparable job. They don't wanna go over into a new line of work. Um, they're just gonna hold out. They're taking a wait and see approach, waiting till late summer 
um, to make a decision. And uh, interestingly enough, I don't know if you saw perhaps the um, uh, TV in Duluth has reported that there are a, a wide number of people that have used the pandemic as an opportunity to say, hey, I'm finally getting out of the business world, I'm gonna retire, or they've used the CARES funding. I know, Vicki, you're gonna tell us that your business has really increased um, in terms of the number of small businesses, uh, people that are getting into the small business world. You know, I've always wanted to do this. There's funding available for me to start my own business. That's what Duluth TV was writing a story or publishing a story about. Um, the, the, the big number of people that are getting into business themselves. So um, one thing also to, we hear a lot about are the unemployment benefits and truly economists have reported that on average, if people are making $34,000 a year or less, that's $16 an hour, they are gonna be making likely more money collecting jobless benefits. So, you know, that's going to be winding down, unfortunately, at the end of the summer for those who are looking for summer work. But we have to make sure that this is something I know small businesses, I hate doing, but there are times when you have to challenge those unemployment benefits. If you have people that you've tried to, that had a job, um, worked for you, continue to work for you, even if they were furloughed, you bring them back to work, they say, no, I wanna stay on un unemployment. They have suitable work uh, with their employer or they leave you because, or you know, don't show up for work because they'd rather go off on unemployment. There are those folks out there, we have to be willing to challenge and we're being encouraged to challenge unemployment benefits when that suitable work is available. So bottom line, the Minnesota deed study suggested that there are a lot of things that employers can do now, but it requires just like we have to change our thinking and how we hire because people aren't necessarily, we post a job, they're gonna be coming to us. In fact, deed told the story, there was a, a gentleman that was part of the research study said he tried an experiment where he um, put on his social media profile that he was looking for work, that uh, all his skills, here's what he was looking for. And he could not report that one single employer reached out to him on his social media, where we know that particularly our millennials are using social media tools to find jobs and to look for work. So, the message there is we have to reframe our thinking in how we look for, look for talent and how we think about what we need to do day in and day out to retain them. So we're gonna move into some specific reasons why employees leave us. They're, they're known reasons. And we're gonna talk specifically what you and I can do on a day in and day out basis, but I'm gonna be challenging you along the way to think about some things that maybe you've done in your business before that might not work now and how you might need to change your way of thinking about certain retention practices. All right, so I think with that, we have another poll, Vicki. All right. Subject, um, hey. Um, load up this one on um, pay raises and I'm gonna relaunch this polling because we tested it out earlier. So this is a one part poll this time. And the question is, do you publish a pay regression scale to your employees? So do you tell them what they could expect for pay raises over time? We have some results coming in. I'll give it another 10 seconds or so for people to answer. All right, I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. And it looks like the majority of people either have a performance-based um, reward system related to pay scale or 
you know, they don't have a regular schedule set. Um, it, it might be intermittent uh, for when they decide to offer those pay raises. Okay, very good. Well, one of the top reasons why people leave organizations is for better pay and benefits. One of the top two reasons they leave, um, according to the research, 35% um, of employees report that that is the top reason that they leave jobs. And there is a fine line as you start thinking about pay. Hang on just a minute. I don't know why sometimes my slides don't move. When we think about pay and benefits, there's a fine line between not enough and too much. I put the golden handcuffs in the slide because there is a possibility that you may pay too much if you're not careful, <clears throat> particularly in your response to what we're experiencing now with the ta talent pipeline. If you pay too much and above market, you can actually force people to stay that really should be moving on. Um, and if it's too little, obviously, they it will prompt them to leave your employment. But all pay, as we think about compensation, is at best about right. It is not a fine science. And what we know from research, and this goes back many, many years, and it's a, a study that I often use to talk about the importance of pay. It will, on the left-hand side, just like working conditions, how people get along with one another, the policies and rules, whether they're fair, the quality of the supervision, wages, salary will cause people to leave if they're not about right. But over on the other side, on the satisfaction factors, on the other hand, the things that are offered relative to recognition, the work itself, personal growth, those are the things that engage employees. So again, pay, if it's not about right, it will force people out of your organization. It'll drive them out for the next job, but it won't drive high performance. And so that's that balancing act we have to think about. Um, how do you know what's the right pay level to be paying? Um, I would suggest you stay away from salary.com but indeed, if you look at some of the research on Indeed, you can actually enter your state or region and find out kind of what the going rate is for certain types of job titles, if you, you stick to the common job titles. Um, so those are the kinds of things, whether it's talking to other business owners in the community, you, you wanna do your research so you know that it's about right. But there's a very interesting HR study that I think is equally as important as what you're paying. And that is, this study suggested that it wasn't just about how much people are paid. That wasn't as big of a factor for satisfaction as how people felt about the process. The study found that five, five times it, there were five times more impact of how people felt about the process itself at, um, compared to the actual pay. So that would suggest to us that pay needs to be fair. It needs to be, um, in some, some organizations find that that transparency is vitally important. So one of your retention strategies I would suggest you think about are some regular pay raises, no matter how small. That should be part of your retention strategy. I would suggest they're based on performance, but you may also want to think about rewarding skill acquisition. Um, I just worked with a um, client in the small business arena that is wanting to create a career ladder. You um, obtain these kinds of skills, 
you get better in these areas. I can see you're demonstrating that every day. I will give you X amount of money more. And that is very important to him to post that for all employees to see and understand the transparency. We all know <laughs> that employees have a right to talk among themselves about their pay. And that's why it can be a big dissatisfier if it's not clear in your business how people impact their pay. <clears throat> so again, equally as important as the amount they're paid is that feeling of whether or not is a fair practice and process. All right, so I think we have another poll here coming up. Yeah. And I, you know, that last piece really resonates with me, Ravina. I think um, from an employee's view, it makes sense. You know, they want to know what they can do to increase their pay um, and have that, like you said, that transparency around what that looks like. All right. So we're going to relaunch polling around incentives. And I, I think a lot of folks answered this at the beginning, but I'll have you do it again. Um, we had it left open on accident when we were practicing. I mean, I just saw a question that come in, Ravina, that maybe you can okay. answer while we wait for people to, to reach sure. on to the poll. And so someone asked, um, what do you do with commissioned employees? I would assume particularly related to that pay scale question. Um, I'm assuming the commission is about sales. I, it, it's a little bit hard to um, um, respond to it without knowing a little bit more, um, but commission employees, I mean, I think if you're working on sales commissions, you have to kind of be continually evaluating that. That's, uh, you get into a little bit different arena there um, because obviously that is performance-based commissions are performance-based, but are they market comparable? Um, and do you have, the thing about commissions, do you have enough that are the basic things that they're compensated for in addition to those sales commissions? You can adjust sometimes those sales commissions depending on how your um, comp program is set up, but you're gonna want to make sure you have identified what the basics are that is expected of everybody and then how those sales commissions um, increase with performance. So it, it's a little hard to address the, the question, but again, it's back to kind of the transparency issue. Yeah. One of the worst things you can do, and I wanted to talk about this um, before we leave the topic of pay increases, is say when you're hiring someone you know, um, I give you increases with performance and then not have the conversation about performance where the person then really gets very um, disengaged and angry when you don't sit down. I think I'm performing. Well, yeah, but the time isn't quite right. You got to, if it's performance based, you got to be really specific so that the person understands just exactly what they're being rewarded for. And sometimes it's best just to say, I will do a review in 30 days or 90 days. We like to start in our small business of retail employees. First of all, you have to know what you can afford long term. You have to think about it in terms of one to two years or however long your retention generally lasts. How much can I afford over that time? because you can't give it all at once in 30 days. Oh, I'm so grateful for how great of a job. And then you pay them the highest rate that you can afford and they don't look at another pay increase you know, for another couple of years. So setting up that comp program requires some real adjustment, thinking about your affordability factor, but how can you make it even small increases, 50 cents an hour, that is a big deal in the retail world. So I encourage you to, to think about some structure that goes along with that. Did you have the results of the poll? I do. Um, I do want to say I had another question come in. 
I think is going to be really relevant to our next section. So I'm going to read the question, um, but Ravina, it might make sense to run through some of the next upcoming slides before we go back to that. Right. So the question was, uh, do you have any suggestions for a federal contractor who's constrained to tight budgets for retention strategies? Um, all federal contracting operates on exceptionally tight budgets and a lot of regulation, what they can and can't do. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, it, there's definitely constraints there, but some of the more creative strategies you have coming up. Um, yeah, let's think about that question because you're, you've got a rigid pay structure um, there. And, you know, so you're going to have to look basically around it and look for other things. Um, the results of the poll here, Vicki? Yeah, so uh, does your business offer incentives to employees? So the second, you know, the second and third options were most popular of, um, they offer incentives, but they're not necessarily, you know, calling them part of the compensation package, um, or they generally don't offer incentives as they think of them. So that's what was most popular. Okay. All right, let's move into this discussion. And I am gonna search for in these um, next few slides, um, some um, um, things for you to think about relative to the federal um, contractor question. Um, incentives can be a meaningful part of someone's compensation package. And let me give you, let me talk about a few things um, to, um, to consider. They're a great way, incentives can be a great way to make up for a less than competitive rate. You're starting out, you can't pay maybe what your competition is paying. There are things that are important to employees, um, whether it's insurance, which we'll talk about um, coming up, paid time off, retirement, cell phone stipends, memberships, over here on the right, um, the, um, uh, the uh, merchandise credits um, that perhaps you give credits on for the merchandise you sell in your business. Um, bonuses, things like birthday bonuses or longevity bonuses, um, paid for time off to volunteer. We have to remember that we have young people coming into the workforce and one of the things that they are saddled with frequently is student loan debt. So thinking about bonuses and incentives can be meaningful to them. When you start talking about, there is one caveat, but it's a caveat that also ought to make us think about thinking of these um, uh, uh, bonuses as part of their comp package and presenting it as such. If you offer cash or cash equivalents, that is reportable on their W-2 forms. That's reportable income to the um, IRS. So if you give them a $25 bonus on their birthday, you may have a heck of a lot of goodwill. And some people will talk about that it, when they talk about working for you. Do you know my boss gives me a $25 bonus on my birthday? I have found that that is so meaningful to our employees. You got to remember to report it. Um, it's not likely to change their tax bracket at the end of the year. Um, and sometimes they look at it on their, on their W-2 and go, what? <laughs> How is that a big bonus? Well, it was. And um, it, it is meaningful to give those sorts of incentives. So some things to think about. Um, because we don't necessarily, as business owners, always consider how meaningful that is when they talk about who they work for and how that boss cares about them. The second most important thing, just changing our attention um, a little bit from the pay and uh, benefits arena, want to talk about work-life balance. That is the second highest factor that causes people to leave. My schedule, my hours. Um, 
one of the things that, um, and it was the number two reported reason for turnover, 25% of employees surveyed um, said that that was the second most um, driver for them to leave an employer. So what can we do with employee schedules to provide that work-life balance? Um, can they trade schedules if they have some, something coming up? Um, is there some less rigidity? Um, that's not the same as trying to work with their personal life, their childcare schedules. That's not the same as not having rules. So there's nothing worse than if you have employees that are frequently calling in, can't come to work, and someone else has to cover their hours. Those are the things you have to pay attention to. Some people say, my work-life balance comes at the cost of other people's work-life balance. So as, a, as an employer, we have to pay attention to that. And we have to, the, being flexible is not the same as having structure, having no structure. So having expectations about when people call in, about their um, level of attendance. You know, we expect you to be here 96% of the time or 98% of the time monitoring their attendance record. That those are drivers of engagement for all employees because there's nothing worse than having to cover for somebody that can't come to work. So we have to balance, the message here is we have to maybe think a little bit more broadly than we have in the past about schedules and about working with people's schedule and not calling them into work um, when it's their day off, if that can be avoided, not calling them at home um, when you know, they're supposed to be off. So these are things that we have to bear in mind as we proceed in these um, kind of tough times. All right. What else is important to my employees? Certainly, if we re think back to the deed study about why people are not coming back into the workplace, that fear um, that's COVID related, um, safety and health. Um, do we have things in place to continue those safety protocols that we all had to put in place for our business? whether it's masking, whether it's sanitation, whether it's social distancing, um, we have to be attuned to those factors. Also, it's important to recognize that we have to pay attention not just to physical safety, safety but mental um, health safety. And as we think about why people stay in organizations, the culture in that workplace, the working conditions, having two things, which has been reported by the Gallup Organist Survey Organization for years, having two things are vital in the workplace, having a boss that cares about me and a best friend at work, which speaks to the connections we make at work. We all know that substance abuse and mental health um, crises have escalated during the pandemic. So part of reboarding our employees tells us that we need to focus on having a place, a workplace that's safe for our employees. That means that we are watching out for some things like this. In addition to the safety protocols, when they come back to work or they're coming to work for the first time, making sure that you go back through some of those things that you may still have in, your pl in place in your workplace, whether it's the hazard assessment that makes sure they know how to use tools and equipment. Um, it's the sanitation protocols, the social distancing, what to do if they do have an exposure to COVID and signs of the virus. These things should be pulled back out in our workplaces as a reminder, particularly as you know, business picks up, we are getting busy, we don't have enough staff. We gotta keep those things in mind and make sure our employees know 
that those things are still important. And so I'm, I'm, I'm cautioning you not to put those to the side and not revisit them. Here are some other things to be on the lookout out, out for in the workplace. Signs of substance abuse or mental health issues. Well, I'm not a mental health professional. How do I know, you know what I should be looking for? Well, you are, if you've had these employees that have worked for you for one to three years in particular that you talked about in the poll, you know those employees. You know when something's different. You know when something's off in their behavior. You can see signs and you can make, know the resources in your community to refer to. Watch for signs of conflicts between employees, math matches, things that are, you know, conflicts that are seething below the surface. Conflicts with customers, intervening when appropriate, performance issues. Again, I just want to point out to you, and this is why I work with so many small businesses on their handbooks, their work rules, just even about calling in sick, what's the expectations, their job descriptions and what the expectations are. This is why I work with so many small businesses because we need to have those tools in place to effectively address performance issues and not let them go just because it's harder than heck <laughs> to find new employees. Speaking from personal experience, there is absolutely nothing worse than having a good employee that one day comes to you and says, I'm leaving, I've got a new job. And you find out the reason is because they were having to do the work of other people. When you weren't looking, another person was sitting down in a job, not doing the cleanup. They were having to do the cleanup every day. You know, all those kinds of factors that can happen in the workplace if we're not paying attention. And it's so hard to balance that when we're trying to run our business, but vitally important on the retention side. So early intervention is key. And I just put a note in the chat too, and I wanted to raise yeah. it up, Ravina, because you mentioned, you know, working with small businesses and the work you do around um, policy manuals and um, you know, creating those policies, tips around um, navigating those and enforcing those. And um, I think that's an important facet of your work. And so um, I just wanted to remind folks that they can work with you one-on-one. -on -one. We have a grant right now for any small business um, that has been affected by COVID-19 can work with you directly or being a one-on-one. -on -one. And so the way um, people can access that is to contact their SBDC consultant. So if you're already working with a small business consultant at the SBDC, you can ask them to connect you to Rubina directly. Um, and I'll put my email in the chat if you uh, aren't sure who, you, who your consultant is or if you are a client of the SBDC, um, you can send me an email as well. So again, that's available at no cost right now to businesses impacted by COVID-19 in some way, whether that's positive or negative. And, um, and so we'd love to connect you with Ravina to get that one-on-one -on -one assistance. Thank you, Vicki. I did have another question come in. So you okay. can, well, I'll let you choose if you wanna take that now or, or get through this slide first, but. Um, let's go ahead and get through a couple more slides and and uh, cause we're almost to the end here and we'll have plenty of time for questions that way. Great. <clears throat> so the, the next thing I want to call your attention to relative to that idea of changing how you think about employee retention is thinking about the power of your business brand. So many millennials in particular talk about the fact that they want to do meaningful work. And they wanna make a difference. They wanna work for an organization that makes a difference in the community. And what I would ask you for in this particular um, idea is to think about, do you know what your reputation is in the community as an employer? What do people say about you? Um, what do they talk about when, you know, with regard to what's it like to work over there? And that's something that you can impact. I know from personal experience that if you're a small business owner in a community, you are frequently 
asked to contribute to causes, to nonprofit organizations that are do good work in your community, you are asked to contribute frequently. If you make those kinds of contributions, if you give back in your community, even if I work with some small businesses that give back a portion of their proceeds, their revenue back into community organizations for the good of all, that is a factor of pride. So don't just give the money without talking about it with your employees. I wanna let you know, these are, this is part of how we're making a difference in our community. I'm giving to these organizations and they contribute to the good for all. So promote the positive um, as you think about um, changing your retention strategies. So why do people like working for you and your company? What does the organization mean to the individuals in your community? You can use these things in ads, you can use them in interviews, and you can use them in your conversations with your employee as you keep them connected and engaged in your business. And so finally, I want to talk about this last best retention strategy in my mind of all retention strategies. Um, and that is um, how you work with your team on a day in and day out basis. I recently listened to a podcast by a gentleman named Marcus Buckingham. He wrote books, First Discover Your Strengths, um, uh, First Break All the Rules, Now Discover Your Strengths. He's a prolific writer for the Gallup Survey Organization and others. And he recently did a podcast where he said, for businesses that are struggling with turnover and employee hiring, you can cut your turnover by 70% by doing one thing. <laughs> And that is spending 15 minutes every week to connect with every employee. Because he says that says to them, I see you and I am thinking about how I can help you. So on that note, and again, remember that employees don't necessarily leave companies. They leave managers and they leave coworkers. Um, so that again speaks to the things that we've been talking about. My favorite retention tool is the STAY interview. There are books actually written about the STAY interview. And that's different than the exit interview when you find out that, hey, they've been struggling with a coworker that wasn't pulling their weight and you didn't notice. And they just decided to, they didn't like the conflict. I'm just getting the heck out of Dodge here. Um, so here's what you ask in the stay interview. You may even say to the employee, hey, I want to spend 10 minutes, you know, before the end of your shift with you, you know, in the next week, let's sit down. I just want to get your thoughts about working for this organization, what you're thinking. This is where you ask questions like this about the job. You're seeking controllable factors. Mostly employees know the things you can control and the things you can't control. Um, they, only, they know there's only so much money you can pay and so forth. But really zeroing in on what's the best part of your job? If there's one thing you could change about your job, what would that be? What would make your world more satisfying, your job more satisfying? Or what do you like most or least about working here? The time to ask those questions is not an exit interview. That's why I hate exit interviews. I like stay interviews. Here's some other things that you can ask. You can ask things like, um, is there anything I should be doing more or less of as your manager or as the owner? What can I do to best support you? And um, just to call your attention to the fact that SHRMS, Society for Human Resource Management, has said, has noted that 74% of employees in the workplace say they want more recognition. They want to be noticed today in our busy lives. And this is the bottom line question. This is where you get to the good stuff. What might tempt you to leave? And if there's anything you can control of these questions, that's the time to do it. 
more on stay interviews, aim for wanting your team, this is one study, aim for wanting your team at a minimum to love more than 20% of their total work activities and hate less than 20% of their work activities. When you do a stay interview, you've just demonstrated that you value your employee, you're committed to them and you care about them. So focus on what you can do. It's surprising that sometimes you find out that things aren't clear in job descriptions or expectations. You haven't been recognizing. They covered a shift for someone. Have you thanked them, just simply thanked them, offered a new assignment or a learning opportunity? So those are all key factors to listening and validating our employees. So with that, um, I want to just say one thing in summary, and then we'll look at your questions. And that is, it's, I think, going to take, and, and I think most experts would say, it's going to take a while for, and some months for, talent supply to catch up with demand. We cannot manufacture workers, but what we can do is control many aspects of their work environment. So I encourage you to think about the things we talked about today. Vicki, if I could ask you for some help going through those questions. Sure, can we um, take a second, maybe Ravina, and just talk a little bit about, uh, again, how people can connect with you. And if you had that slide on our area, um, since I know we kind of breezed past it in the beginning, we were eager to get started. But a reminder for folks, um, Northland SBDC, we serve the seven counties of Northeastern Minnesota. And our goal is to provide um, technical assistance to small businesses at no cost. And so we're funded by uh, federal, state, and local grant funding. And that allows us to work with you one-on-one -on -one at no cost. And so like I mentioned today, um, we have the ability to connect you with Ravina to work one-on-one -on, -one on your HR questions that you may have, um, whether that's a half hour or uh, you know several hours of, of work with Ravina, we can connect you on that. We also have experts in marketing, keeping, um, and you know what we've been doing for many years, uh, helping you understand your finances, developing business plans, um, you know, really understanding and, and strategizing around your business, buying and selling a business. These are all things that we offer. So if you aren't already a client and you're interested in this, go to northlandsbdc.org and click the button request for services to sign up. Um, and I'll put my email again in here. If you have any questions, um, look in the chat, you can send me an email as well. And then um, at the end of the training too, I wanted to note um, when you exit out of the webinar, it'll provide, they'll pop up a, a survey for you to fill out. If you could do that, it would be great for us to know how we did today and to give us suggestions for the kinds of trainings you wanna see um, around small business moving forward. And I just so wanna add before you get into some of the sure. questions, the federal contractor, um, limitations with pay question. I hope that um, you'll consider some of the other things we talked about, particularly the stay interviews, because you, I, I can speak from personal experience, you will find so many things of surprising nature <laughs> when you do those stay interviews that, you know, you may find them to be pretty easily met in terms of a, a, a need um, that you might well have overlooked. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting point, Ravina, too, um, of, you know, if you are wondering what kind of incentives or changes your employees are looking for to improve retention, you can ask them, right? And so that's really how I view that state interview uh, that you talked about. And I think as managers, a lot of times, um, and business owners, we don't think about actually just asking employees what they're looking for. So I think that's great advice. Um, and the first question that had come in is actually um, from, you know, that related to that same question of federal contractor retention. And uh, the person asked, um, you know, noted that all their employees are remote. And so they, you know, they don't see them, they're physically distanced. Um, and so, you know, if you had any tips around incentives, um, you know, knowing that pay limitation and in federal contracting, certain expenses are not uh, allowed, right, under contract. So from that perspective of a remote worker, is there something you have in mind? 
Well, um, I just recently actually um, did a workshop on remote work and uh, um, and interestingly enough, um, you know, we we do know that there will probably more than likely be a continuation of remote work in the future. Some people are attracted to those sorts of jobs and looking for them um, to stay remote. They require a whole different approach in my mind. You have to have structure in those relationships. Um, I always have certain expectations of remote workers in terms of productivity. They, those re arrangements require a fair amount of structure from my experience, but they also require some, some creative approaches to getting people the socialization. You have a wide variety of remote workers. Some like remote work because they're total introverts and some really miss that engagement. You have to figure that out as a manager. I think managers have to connect um, in a very structured, regular way, whether it's daily with that remote worker to find out what the plans are for the next day, find out what got accomplished, find out anything that they're challenged with or any support they need. But there also has to be some um, mechanism for the socialization piece, whether it's birthday celebrations online with the team or whatever it is. And that's another place to start asking the question of your employees um, because you will find things that, you know, for most of us are very enlightening when people get to talking. So there's been much written about things that can be done to more fully engage remote workers. I do think that's the wave of the future. I do think it needs structure and expectations. And, you know, I think you have to establish kind of that culture for your remote workers. Sure. Great. Well, I'll put a call out for any last questions um, in the chat or Q&A feature. Um, you know, going back, I think I mentioned uh, in the chat, someone talked about giving bonuses using gift cards, um, you know, as something, you know, something tangible, right, that you can give your employee to. Um, another business does company logo wear um, for oh, their yes. employees, right, as a potential yeah, option lo as well. Logo wear is, uh, a lot of people really like that and value that. Um, the gift cards, of course, if they're, you know, usually people use the $25 or more gift cards, you know, that's, that's reportable income, that's cash or cash, cash equivalent, but not something that isn't really valuable. We've used those, our employees love them. Sure. Great. Well, it looks like we, we've gotten through the questions that we had today. Ravina, I wanted to thank you again for um, providing this training on uh, you know, retention strategies. And I'd encourage any small businesses um, you know, watching this to consider going to our next training. I believe it's June 23rd. You can sign up on our website at northlandsbdc.org. And um, you'll hear from Arena as well as a few benefits experts about what your options really are. Um, and you know, when you could start thinking about that from a revenue standpoint, is your business big enough to support really start thinking about benefits because that can be a big retention strategy as well. Wonderful. And some thanks in the chat for your, your work today, Ravina. Um, and as a reminder, uh, contact me by email or your SBDC consultant if you're looking to work with Ravina one-on-one -on -one for your small business. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording. So Thank you. Thank you all.